me know how I'm sounding. How are we sounding? No, John, this is not the Dune Wave. We will be premiering the Dune Wave in just a moment. Hi! Oh, thank you. I sound great. Perfect. That's what I needed to hear. <laughs> That's what I needed to hear. All right, guys. Oh, let me let me fix my little dumb thing on top of my head. Yeah, my friend, um, my friend the other day was exclaiming about how crazy it was that I run around with what looks like a ball sack on top of my head and that I just do whatever I want. <laughs> it's just like, oh, really? You think it looks like a ball sack? And I was like, I thought it kind of looked like a crown, but whatever. Um, <laughs> hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Dune Club 2, Session 2. I am so excited to be here with you guys today. Let me, let me move over here. Let me move over here. We're, let's get settled in. Let's get settled in. Let's get all going. Hey. Hey. Um, too, too quiet. Do you think this is too... Is everyone, does anyone else think this is too quiet? Is anyone else? Is it just this guy? <laughs> um, uh, all right. Let me, let me kind of place this over here. How you guys doing today? How's it going? Um, I'm a little bit of a mess. You know, I'm not gonna lie. Your your teacher here is a little bit of a mess today, but I'm ready. I'm ready. I did it. I'm like super excited. Um, for for Doom Club session two, and I just want to go ahead and for all you people who are not reading out of this particular book, which you should be reading out of this particular book. But if you're not, if you if you have to. <laughs> You gotta be crazy. Um, the final sentence of these chapters uh, for this session is she turned away from the cards, sat in agitation, wondering if Irulan might yet destroy them. So uh, that's where we stopped. So for all you guys out there who's like, whatever. But um, before we get into it, uh, I would like to premiere a little something for you guys while we're waiting for everybody to show up because I know it takes like a minute for everybody to get here so it's like I like to like give us like you know a few minutes before we get started so before we get started I'm going to give you the live world premiere of Dune Wave I'm so excited to share this with you guys um, this is something that just came together magically those are the best projects, right? When like everything just kind of happens and you're like, I didn't even push that hard and this just happened and this is amazing. Uh, I have been, I am a personal fan of uh, this guy, Akira the Dawn. T-H-E-D-O-N, not D-A-W-N, Akira the Dawn. Uh, somebody I think on Twitter turned me on to his Watts Wave stuff. Uh, he is a wave lord, is what you call a wave lord, <laughs> and uh, he's a he's a genius music man, and uh, he has created a lot of uh, meaning wave. That's something that he's really been into, where he's taking things like Alan Watts, who is uh, such an amazing philosopher, and taking his lectures, and then turning them into amazing music. Where and then he'll like play like certain words over and over again and like really emphasize certain points with the music and I think it's just such a great way to get into uh, a lot of these different philosophers ideas. Uh, I personally, he's got three Watts Waves uh, and Watts Wave 3 has been my super jam. I love all three of them but particularly Watts Wave 3 because it's really talking about time and how time is an illusion. Uh, and so I've been playing that just like over and over and over again. It's really helping me to like wrap my mind around these concepts. And uh, these are like he Alan Watts talks a lot about Eastern philosophy. Also, fun fact, Alan Watts has the sexiest voice in philosophy. Maybe there's other people out there. I don't know. But so far of all of the philosophers that I've heard listen uh, recorded, I've heard recorded, Alan Watts just, oh, his voice is, he uses, the, he's got the Bene Gesserit voice. Like when I listen to him, I'm just like, wow, this guy has got such a powerful, amazing voice. Uh, he's really great at talking and that's why he went around and did like a shit ton of lectures while he was alive. So anyways, um, so we became, we started chatting, me and Akira started chatting on Twitter and being, I was like, oh my God, I love your stuff, you know? And he's like, oh wow, I like, I love your stuff. And, uh, and so he reached out to me and was like, hey, I got an idea uh, for some Dune Wave. 
you know like let's let's make some dune wave what do you say and i was like i'm so in fam like say no more what what do you need and I, uh, I recorded a bunch of random stuff. I was like, I don't know what he's gonna do with this. I, I hope this works. I hope this is what he wants. But uh, I recorded uh, a lot of different um, Dune quotes and things of me like reading from the book and some of my favorite passages. And he, in a few weeks, he, he, well, he recently got back to me this week. And uh, he, we have a four song, four song EP, Dune Wave. He's created four songs out of this uh, audio file that I sent him. And it is so fire. Like, I'm so excited. I, it's been given, like, I've been really drained. Uh, if you haven't noticed, I recently aired the final episode of my show. So I've been going really, I've been really up and down. It's just mostly down. And uh, Dune Wave has absolutely been giving me life. It is something that I needed this week. It's something I am so excited for, uh, so excited to share with you guys. So uh, I'm gonna, we're gonna play, we're gonna play like a little bit of it. We're gonna play like maybe half the songs now. I don't know, maybe we'll play the full thing. I don't know, it's like 15 minutes long. So I don't know, we'll see like how many people, we're, we're gonna let more people show up to uh, to the live stream. But uh, we will, I'm gonna share some of the stuff with you guys. We'll play some more of it at the break and then uh, we'll play it again at the end. Uh, I'm really excited to share this with you. So here we go. Um, let's see here. All right, guys. Are you ready? First of all, are you ready? I need to I need to see some 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 emotes. I need to see some excitement out there. Are you fucking are you ready to put your hand in this fucking box, dude? Are you ready? Cuz like you're 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 never your whole life is never going to be the same. You know, we're going to make more too. We were talking, I just visited him uh, at a studio downtown. He lives in LA. And uh, he was like, oh, man, like, let's do Dune Wave 2, like Dune Wave 3. I was like, uh, yes, yes, yes. So excited. So, OK, I see the excitement. The excitement is pumping up. You guys, yes, yes. You get me pumped. Um, all right. Here we go. Get ready. Have your socks knocked off. Dune Wave. <laughs> I hold at your neck, the Gonjabar. I hold at your neck, the Gonjabar. The Gonjabar, the high-handed enemy. It's a needle with a drop of poison on its tip. Ah uh ah, -uh, don't pull away or you'll feel that poison. Son must know about poisons. The quick ones and the slow ones and the ones in between. Here's a new one for you, the Gomjabar. It kills only animals. Suggest you may be human. If you withdraw your hand from the box, you die. This is the only rule. This is the only rule. If you withdraw your hand from the box, you die. This is the only rule. This is the only rule. Keep your hand in the box and live. Keep your hand in the box and live. Keep your hand in the box and live. Withdraw it and die. I must not fear. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it is gone fast, I will turn the inner eye to see it fast. When the fear is Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it comes out, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. 
Pain. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? from the box, young human, and look at it. Do it. Do it. Do it. He jerked his hand from the box, stared at it, astonished. astonished. Not, a mark. Not a mark. No sign of agony on the flesh. He held up the hand, turned it, flexed the fingers. Pain, she sniffed. A human can override any nerve in the body. Ever sift sand through a screen? We Bene Gesserit sift people to find the humans. Find the human, find the human. Paul felt that he had been infected with terrible purpose. Terrible purpose. Terrible purpose. Terrible purpose. Terrible purpose. He did not know yet what the terrible purpose was. Why do you test for humans? To set you free.
to set you free. Free? Once, men turned their thinking over to machines in the hopes that this would set them free. 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 That only permitted other men with machines to enslave them. To enslave them. Thou shalt not make a machine the likeness of a human mind. The Reverend Mother must combine the seductive wiles of a courtesan with the untouchable majesty of a virgin goddess. Holding these attributes in tension, so long as the powers of her youth endure. For when youth and beauty have gone, she will find that the place between, once occupied by tension, has become a wellspring of cunning and resourcefulness. with which Muad'Dib learned the necessities of Arrakis. The Bene Gesserit, of course, know the basis of this speed. For the others, we can say that Muad'Dib learned rapidly because his first training was in how to learn. And the first lesson of all was the basic trust that he could learn. It is shocking to find how many people do not believe they can learn and how many more believe learning to be difficult. Muad'Dib knew that every experience carries its lesson. Greatness is a transitory experience. It is never consistent. It depends in part upon the myth-making imagination of humankind. The person who experiences greatness must have a feeling for the myth he is in. He must reflect what is projected upon him. And he must have a strong sense of the sardonic. This is what uncouples him from belief in his own pretensions. The sardonic is all that permits him to move within himself. Without this quality, even occasional greatness will destroy a man. Hey guys, what'd you think? <laughs> we got three out of four. We did three out of four. Uh, thank you so much for bearing with me while I play our fire song, Dune Wave. I'm so fucking pumped. Like, it's like giving me the most life. Like, this is like the best thing that's happening in my life. Like, out of everything that's going on in my life, 
this is the best thing that's happening in my life right now. Uh, it's so exciting. So yeah, it's uh, it is going to be if you want to. Um, Check it out. It's on Spotify. It's going to be on Apple Music. Uh, so if you want to download it, play it around your songs, we're going to have it. Uh, the full length version of all the songs are going to be on. Uh, I'm going to be uploading it to my channel on YouTube. Uh, Akira is going to be putting out the singles on his channel. So we're doing this whole thing. Um, I'm so excited. So thank you for letting me share dune wave with you uh i'm so excited i saw some really funny comments somebody said my wig just flew to arrakis and i was like fucking dying like i was like i'm literally like texting with akira right and i was like wow you guys i was like oh my god this is so far people are loving you and he's like oh my god i'm wondering like we we're just so pumped we we're just so excited so thank you uh for coming with us on this journey to arrakis we need to have a dune rave uh i think that that's a great idea thank you for everybody who subscribed also during during that Yes, awesome, so pumped. So without further ado, let's get into our lesson today. Uh, it's almost an hour in, we haven't even talked about the book because I'm bad. So, all right. Session two of Dune Club Two, here we go. Uh, this is pages 49 through 107 and ends on, she wondered if Irulan might yet destroy them. So let's start with our overview, shall we? Shall we? We shall. In session two of Dune Club, we see each of our conspirators in action on the planet Arrakis. The conspiracy to destroy Muad'Dib has found support within the Fremen people. In an Arakeen suburb, Saitail the Face Dancer meets with Farak, a veteran of the Jihad and former siege mate to Usul. He gains distrans information and access to a particular Fremen woman. Meanwhile, Paul sits in a heated council with his posse, Cheney, Alia, and Stilgar, along with our woman on the inside, Irulan, and Korba, the traitor within the Kizarit mentioned previously in Bronzo's uh, scandalous analysis of history. Next, our guild navigator, Edric, shows up in Imperial Court and presents the Emperor with the gift of of hate, a Leilaksu Zensuni Mentat Gola created from the dead body of Duncan Idaho, a mentor who had sacrificed his life for Paul during the fall of House Atreides. And despite knowing this Gola is some kind of trap, Muad'Dib cannot help but to accept this revenant into his household. And finally, the Reverend Mother Gaius Helen Mohim has been captured aboard the Highliner, which brought Edric to Arrakis, and is now being held in a cell beneath Paul's keep. Irulan comes to see her Bene Gesserit superior and receives difficult instructions. The princess must A, give up trying to convince Paul to impregnate her, B, try to get Paul and Olya to hook up, and C, uh, do whatever she has to to make sure Cheney does not get pregnant, even at the cost of her own life. So let's start uh, with conspiracy files, Sightail and Farak. Because <laughs> like, I, I really loved these four chapters together because it's like we've already set up the conspiracy in our first session. And so now we see everyone who's involved in this, plus new people, you know, because originally they were talking about maybe we can find support within the Kizarit. Maybe we can find support within the Fremen people. Maybe we can find support within the Landsrad, you know. And so, and they've gone out and they've checked off all the boxes. They found all the support that they can find for this. And uh, and so now we have our face dancer spy, Sightail, who is uh, contacting their Fremen agent, Farak, and he's doing this to receive distrans data information. Um, this transmission contains uh, information about every cell of the conspiracy on Arrakis, every name, every contact phrase, all the vital information that will help them capture a sandworm and potentially start spice cycle on another planet as to break Muad'Dib's melange monopoly. A, now, let's talk about what a distrans message is, because it's kind of vague. It's a little vague. It's a little weird, but I'm going to try my best here. Uh, a distrans is an encrypted audio message stored and retrieved from within the neural pathways of a living creature. This technology was used to send coded messages back and forth between two points in the absence 
of any outlawed computer-based technology serving the same purpose. So say you have some really important information. You don't want anyone to, to find out about it. Well, the Fremen, and they, they developed uh, this technology, this trans stuff. They had it, and it was briefly mentioned in the first Dune, where they have bats. And they will, you know, rec- like, they put this little bat, they put a little crystal in their brain, and then he's got a little receiver, and then they say something to this bat or something, and then they make them fly off, and the, and the bat flies. And then whoever gets it repeats a passphrase to this little bat, and then the bat will spit out this information. And it will sound like the other person's voice, though. I think it really is like a, like a radio t- kind of transmission. Um, so Farak's son, who is present during this entire situation, he's playing the balisette in the background. And, the, and this message was somehow transmitted into Saitail's brain through the music. And he has no idea. Saitail has no idea what information, what the information is consciously. Like it's inside of him, but he can't consciously access it. Um, it's only when somebody else uh, gives him the proper phrase or password and then he will the recite the message. The message will come out. So, like, that's some pretty intense stuff. And I thought it was really interesting when during the scene where it's like he forgets hearing the Balisset music go off, you know, and then he's, like, disturbed by it. And then things kind of, like, click and he's like, oh, wait, I'm being – even he doesn't – it's like he's also a pawn in all of this. And so this is kind of like he doesn't even know when messages are being transmitted into him necessarily. I mean, he kind of figures it out, but he's like, oh, I guess that was it, you know. But it's like, wow, like what a crazy, what a crazy deal. And I think it's interesting that Saitel and Farak briefly discuss how Muad'Dib also uses men to carry distrans messages, uh, especially uh, revenue information. Uh, especially that, because I love how Saitel puts it, where he's like, more than one government has fallen when the people find out the true extent of official wealth. Um, and so, but Farak thinks this is gross, okay? Because the Fremen, when they use this technology, they do not implant it into people. They put it into lower animals, like bats, the Sielgo. So, and I think it's interesting that he he started with, in my day, you know, Farak is like, he's such a grumpy old Fremen man. He's like, in my day, distrans messages were implanted only in the lower animals. Um, and this kind of brings us to why our conspiracy has found allies within the Fremen people. Uh, many within the community long for the old days and the old ways. Uh, and it's like before the jihad, Okay, and before Paul took over and like everything, the Fremen were considered some of the lowest people on the Imperium total totem pole. Uh, their Im- oppression, but their oppression, they were so oppressed and they had like no money. I mean, they had spice, which was awesome, but they didn't have anything else. Um, their oppression made them strong and sharp and noble. You know, I mean, having that much pressure on you and I mean, and the pressure, the environment that they're in and the impression from the Imperial, uh, the Imperial shit going on it's like it made them this amazing beautiful thing i mean it turned them into a diamond essentially i mean there's so much pressure on this coal they turned into a diamond and things were so much simpler so much more beautiful so much less complicated uh money by the way complicates things and so um so now after conquering world after world after becoming some of the wealthiest people in the Imperium on one of the wealthiest planets, the Fremen have become have become disillusioned. Uh, instead of having amazing spiritual spice orgies in their siege, uh, they've na- they're now having gratuitous feasts. They're boning slave girls uh, in the Imperial Keep. It's not about mingling your soul. It's just about like having a good time. Uh, many Fremen men. Um, and it's also like many Fremen men like who participated in this jihad, who went out to conquer these worlds, they didn't participate in it because they really believed all of this religious ideology that has grown up around Paul, you know, the Mahdi and the Messiah and all that stuff. I mean, they're like, yeah, this guy's awesome, but really it's not about the ideals. It's more about going out for adventure and fortune. And I mean, that's why a lot of people join the military. Um, is not because you necessarily i mean yeah you may okay yeah the ideals okay that's cool but really it's more about you know fame not fame and fortune but like fortune and adventure for a lot of people and um and many went out into this universe and they came back maimed 
including Farrakh's blind son, whose eyes were burned out by an atomic weapon, uh, the stone burner. And um, and it's like the they're left with like, yes, they conquered the universe, you know, but like they're left with like the realities of it, of like the realities of war, which fucking suck. OK, because that's the thing. Like people don't like, oh, yeah, let's get in a war. Yay. And then. And then you have a war and then it's like, oh, yeah, this fucking sucks. You know, like there are painful realities. People die. People are maimed. People lose their eyes. People lose what I, I mean, you know, it's like people lose a lot of things. And it's like, oh, wait, this sucks. You know, and so kind of the Fremen of kind of like there's people within the Fremen community who are at that point where it's like, oh, wait, this sucks. Um, and I think it's really funny of the idea of Fremen suburbs have popped up. Like, I love that, like, this whole meeting takes place on a fucking cul-de-sac. There's a fucking Fremen cul-de-sac. Like, the idea of a, a Fedekin death commando living in the burbs is kind of fucking hilarious. Because it's so absurd. It's like, of course, like, these guys, you can't put these people in the suburb. Like, it's just like, oh, it's just such a bummer. Um, and it's like, Farak himself, he was not awed by some abstract, you know, myth or mysticism about Muad'Dib. Uh, he joins the jihad because he longed to see an ocean with his own eyes. You know, it's like people, I loved when he was talking about how it's like, people said, you know, Muad'Dib's soul is in the moon. And he's like, I didn't understand that. He's like, I, I, people say like all this crazy stuff. I'm like, I, I didn't care. What I did care about was I heard that there was uh, bodies of water so large that they went as far as the eye can see and farther. And I, what? Like, that doesn't even compute. Like, that's something that's, like, practical and tangible that he can hold on to. And that's something that that is more awe-inspiring. The idea of that is more awe-inspiring than the religious ideas uh, around Paul. And so that's why he joins up. And he finally, uh, and when he finally experiences a sea on another world far away, he immerses himself and is baptized by the mother of chaos. Uh, cause it's like to him again, it's like, he was just this yokel on this dusty planet. Who's like, what you're telling me there's water as for that's fucking crazy. You're fucking bonkers. There's nobody has that much water, you know, like that's so fucking stupid. And here he is on another world and now he sees it and he's even dunked himself completely. I mean, like for a Fremen to like swim I mean that's not something like to, to even get in the I mean most of the Fremen men with him were so scared they didn't even get in the ocean like they couldn't even do it they were just like this is terrifying I mean it's such a terrifying and beautiful thing it's like the it's sublime to them you know and when people come in contact with the sublime they're generally changed and Farak was changed and now he goes from being this guy who couldn't believe in the absurd idea of a sea of, of somebody who's immersed himself in it. And now anything is possible. His innocence is lost. Um, immersing himself in the impossible, he now sees, you know, what a fool he was. And it's just like he, he loses the will to keep fighting. You know, it's just like I came I came here. I saw what I needed to see. Uh, like, I, I don't. This is crazy. You know, it's like the world, the universe is so much bigger than his small ideas. And so after Saitail receives his distrans information, uh, he assassinates Farak and his son. And he assumes Farak's identity. And there is a female there. There's a female Fremen who is uh, Othalim's daughter who lives next door. And uh, she has been, because Othalim's son was blinded, you know, in the Fremen culture, if you're blind, you're not a man anymore. You need to go out into the desert and die. Like, you are you are a burden on the tribe. But now that they have so much wealth, it's like, oh, well, now we can take care of our wounded. Like, now it's like, because before they were under such pressure that, like, if you were blind, they didn't have time for your shit. So it's like, get out of here. But now things have changed, you know, and now you can take care of a blind person. But they still have that old feeling. I mean, that you can't just change the, <laughs> you can't just change how everybody's been doing things for thousands of years and expect them to be, like, totally chill with it. Um, and so he has, this son is so desperate to get a Fremen woman that he gets this girl um, addicted on Samuda and he plays this stuff for her and like it doesn't, obviously it doesn't work out now. She just, she doesn't even remember or know why she's like there. It's all fucked up. But um, anyway, so he assumes for identity and he takes this Fremen woman and leads her out the back door towards her death. For what purpose? We will find out later. 
Next, we have Inside Paul's Imperial Council Meeting, starring Paul, Cheney, Alia, Stilgar, Irulan, and Korba. All right, we've got the we've got the big Monday meeting going on, and I love how this chapter starts with uh, the header of "Empires do not suffer emptiness of purpose at the time of their creation. It is when they have become established that aims are lost and replaced by vague ritual." And so that lets us know that, like, okay, let's see the vague ritual. You know, it's like, yeah, like, there was so much purpose when Paul was like, I got to win the empire and I got to bring the guild down and I got to bring the, I got to bring every, the whole universe to heal. You know, that was his goal and it was like a shining goal and it's an, a simple goal. And it's, I mean, it's not a simple goal, but it's like, it's easy. But like now once you're established, I mean, it's kind of like Robert, um, King Robert at Game of Thrones. You know, it's like he was great at winning the throne, but then when he gets on it, it's like, Heavy is the head that wears the fucking crown. Like, it is not fun to be a ruler. Like, it's fun to win an empire, but to rule one is tiring. <laughs> it's like having, it's like having, like, billions of children, you know? It's like, now you're in charge of billions of children, you know? Like, that's pretty intense. And so, so now we get to see what it's like at the top. Uh, like, running the throne is bureaucracy, essentially. It's like you just have to become a politician and a bureaucrat. And uh, it's it's bureau bureaucracy with a capital bitch. This sucks, you know, <laughs> like because it is not like I know I would be bummed if I was in Paul's position. And having an imperial council meeting, um, it's a bit of a shit show. Alia is over here trolling Korba. Like, I love Alia. I love her trolling everybody. Like this, you have this 15, almost 16 year old girl who isn't a girl who is an old woman who's lived like thousands of lives uh and she is just like talking so much shit i loved it uh and corba is just like this sanctimonious piece of trash uh i love it when he gets drunk off of the crumb of religious power that paul gives him you know when it's like when he asks uh, corba to perform the prayer for the pilgrims and they're like oh but my lord they're expecting you and he's like put on the turban no one will know the difference just i don't want to fucking like this is fucking stupid and he goes out there and hit and corba being in the position of power to lead these religious pilgrims you know it's just like he gets drunk off of it i mean he's immediately drunk off this power and uh and uh, Cheney and Irulan also, they're feuding, okay? So, like, so not only do you have Alia trolling Korba, you have Chani and Irulan who are feuding. Irulan's, like, putting jabs out there. Chani's, like, you're stupid. Like, no. Uh, Stilgar is desperately trying to keep this Monday meeting moving forward. And, and it's also, this is the first time we've seen Stilgar. Uh, this is the first time that we've seen Alia. Uh, and it's just like Stilgar to go from being a Fremen knave and being like the leader of Siege Tabor to now, you know, having a bunch of f folders and files and having to just push a meeting forward. It's like, I mean, it's he's the perfect man for the job, but it's like I could see how he would be bummed on that job, too. Like it's like it's they're they're trapped. You know, it's like they were very free before, even though they were completely oppressed. They were they had more freedom and oppression than they do now that they're in charge. And meanwhile, Paul is like desperately trying to pretend like he gives a shit about any of this. I mean, he's going through his existential crisis still. He is on the struggle bus uh, and he's having to deal with all these problems. And he's just like, I, I don't even care, you know. And so today on the agenda, we have one. The Guild wants Paul to sign the Two Pile Treaty, which states uh, that the secret location of two pile will be uh, will remain secret and only known to the guild and this place is like a group of sanctuary it's not just one planet it's a group of planets and it is a sanctuary for great houses who are defeated exiled or go renegade uh so and i remember this in the in the dune club where they talked about Le duke leto thought about going renegade with his family and people asked me, well, where would they go? And then I was like, I don't know. I just go off into space. I totally uh, dropped the ball on that one. They would go to Two Pile. They would, the, the, the correct answer is they would go there. Uh, so that's like this place where you can go chill. And, um, and by the way, this treaty has been 10 years in the making. I mean, they have been going over this treaty for 10 years. Um, and so uh, two, Ix 
does not want to pay imperial taxes and is rallying for a constitution. Very American of them. I think that's really funny. It like really cracks me up how like, I don't want to pay these taxes and I want a motherfucking constitution, you know, like it's so good. Uh, three, Shaddam, Ireland's dad, who was the deposed emperor, he has got to stop putting his legions through landing maneuvers. This guy is, has, they, they let him have one legion just to like make him, like they like to want to take everything. But then he's still over there doing shit, like pretending like he's going to get the throne back or something. And it's just like, okay, just, just t- tell your dad to stop. Tell your dad to stop before he gets himself killed. And uh, four, the Bene Gesserit want to consult Paul about his bloodline. <laughs> like a formal, like, I mean, the, the Bene Gesserit are going to are gonna attack him from every possible way. A formal, hey, can we help you out? Hey, hey, hey. And then also not only a formal deal, but they're also going about it in every indirect way. Like they're just trying every way to get in on this bloodline situation. Like who's going to be his heir? Like, please, like we don't want to lose your genes. Like you're the product of thousands of years of our eugenics breeding program. Like, oh, my Lord. And then he's like, no, nope, excuses. Just give him excuses. I, I don't care. Uh, five. Irulan, uh, this brings up the fact that Paul does not have an heir. And so Irulan, number five, brings up that she's the one who wants to, to carry Paul's child. You know, Cheney says, I can't figure it out. I can't make it happen. And Irulan's, well, you know, maybe I should do it. And uh, Paul is like, I love how Paul deals with this, you know, because it's like in this universe, um, artificial insemination is something like that's like, against their deal you know they're like no 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 like people don't like that's not cool um and that's also why a lot of people are weird about the leiloxu because the leiloxu do weird things you know it's like say what you will about the bene gesserit they're manipulative as fuck but they get that seed they get it the the honest way you know they seduce a man and they get that seed in an act of love you know it's it's not just not stealing it in a pipette it's not it's not growing something in an axolotl tank you know it's it's that and so paul is like i love how he's like you know what like we all know that Irulan, you don't like me dude like you don't even like me you know so it's like maybe if you know the bene gesserit weren't trying if you weren't part of the bene gesserit bullshit program i know that you're their pawn and maybe if you weren't doing this for your own personal power, maybe if you actually liked me and wanted to genuinely like have a kid with me, I would consider it. I would possibly consider it. But seeing that you don't, uh, you don't love me, bitch. Like it, I'm not, I'm not gonna put my dick in you. Uh, and then six, the guild wants to build a formal embassy on Arrakis uh, to complete with a guild steersman, which, uh, which uh, he's like, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, bring, maybe I can do something with this weird guy. Bring bring him on. Bring him down. Now, let's go back to, to one and two. So in order to get to sign the two-pile treaty, um, well, okay, first, let's go, back, let's go back to two. Ix doesn't want to pay imperial taxes. Uh, and Paul is like... They want this constitution. Let's and I saw a lot of you on um, Patreon asking me questions about this because that's something that's like I was like, ooh, this is like, this is for, for right now, like how everyone is so, um, you know, upholding the constitution. This is an idea that's very much you know hammered into us. This is an idea that like this constitution really means something, uh, and we have to stick to this constitution. This is something that's like really like in the public consciousness right now. And uh, for those of you, let's just look, let's just go ahead and define it. A constitution is a body of fundamental principles or established precedents according to which a state or other organization is acknowledged to be governed. OK. And uh, Paul puts it as an imagined rule of law. You know, I, I like that. He's like, it's an imagined rule of law. It's an idea that we all come up with. and We say, OK, here's the rules. Let's sign it. We're all going to play by these rules. And if any of us don't play by these rules, then we, um, I guess, you know, then we're the bad guy and need to be taken out or something. And, uh, and Paul goes on to say, constitutions become the ultimate tyranny. Their organized power on such a scale as to be overwhelming. The constitution is social power mobilized and it has no conscience. It can crush the highest and the lowest, removing all dignity and individuality. It has an unstable balance point and no limitations. I, however, have limitations, and in my desire to provide an ultimate protection for my people, I forbid 
a constitution and then goes on to say, hey, uh, tell the guild that we will sign the two pile treaty as is totally chill. Uh, but Ix has to pay our taxes. And so if the guild withdraws, you know, they'll be like, the guild will just be like, Ix, you got to pay these taxes because we need this treaty done. And if you don't pay your fucking taxes, we're going to stop doing commerce with you. Like, you're not going to be able to ship anything in. You're not going to be able to ship anything out. Uh, so Ix really doesn't have much of, uh, now they're they're screwed, you know? It's like now they're going to have to pay the taxes and they don't get a, to- a constitution. Um but one thing that I wanted to talk about, because I know a lot of people were, you know, America, we're very pro-Constitution in America um, and everywhere else. But it's, it's again, an imagined rule of law. And it's not that constitutions are good or evil. They are what they are. Frank Herbert has ideas about law. And, <laughs> like, law is something that it's, like, it's something you give to a child who can't who can't um, regulate themselves. You know, laws are for people who don't feel like they have any control over themselves. Like, like, do you really need a law in place telling you not to kill someone to know that like that's not cool? You know, do you really need a law in place saying you know this that or the other? To you know, it's like it, people. Frank Herbert wants individuals to be so self sufficient. And, and, and built, it's, it's so solid. He wants individuality to be so solid that laws are no longer needed because people just use their fucking brains and they act right, you know? And if they don't act right, he believes that arbitration is the best way instead of laws. Um, there's something, and this is further on, this is, I think, I'm not sure if this is from Chapter House Dune, it may be from Heretics of Dune, but there's an amazing character, Darwi Odrade, and I love her. And she, this Dune quote explains this Dune quote, where she says, give me the judgment of balanced minds in preference to laws every time. Codes and manuals create patterned behavior. All patterned behavior tends to go unquestioned, gathering destructive momentum. So it's like we know that there are still going to be disputes. Even if your people are solid, there's still going to be disputes, you know. But instead of turning to laws, uh, we should turn to arbitration. You know, have somebody come in, a mediator, who can mediate if people cannot figure out their shit on their own. You know, like, and that's something that the Bene Gesserit end up evolving into is becoming kind of like the Imperium's mediators. Uh, <laughs> so... Um, because yeah, laws are like laws are kind of fucked up. I mean, like sometimes it's like, you know, breaking a law. It's like there are definitely times where people are breaking the law, but they're doing the right thing. But yet they have to go to jail, you know. And we all know they're doing the right thing, but and they're breaking and a law, laws can be unjust, you know. Not every law is just. By the way, we've got a beans here. We've got a beans on the set. Beans wants to get on this action. What do you think? Tell us your thoughts. Oh, she doesn't have anything to say. That's that's surprising. Um, but yeah. <laughs> so so yeah, I mean, so that's like that's uh that's something that I, I think that we should all kind of think about. It's just like laws, you know, laws and bureaucracy aren't really helpful in a lot of ways. They can become very destructive. They can destroy somebody's life, like, and they can, you know, like he like like Paul is saying, um, they have no conscience. Laws have no conscience. You know, sometimes someone breaks the law, but it's like, hey, you know what? Like, for example, uh, you have somebody who's starving to death, and then they they break a law and they steal some food for themselves, and then okay, so now if the law is like if you steal food and the punishment is death, it's like okay, well now you die. But it's like that person doesn't deserve to die for that. They weren't doing it out of greedy things. It's like it was a survival s- situation. Um, So it's like laws can crush the highest and the lowest. You know, they're dangerous. They're a double-edged sword, just like everything else. So that's an interesting thing. I think we should all think about, you know, um, Frank Herbert really wants all of us little BBs to learn how to to take care of our own problems. And uh, if there becomes a problem where we need help, turn to arbitration. Laws are for people who don't trust themselves, who can't trust their people, who, you know, and so if we build up from the from the bottom up you know things will be much better okay moving on so um let's talk about some of my favorite moments from this whole situation this whole uh this whole deal uh let's go back to alia trolling corba 
I love when he goes out there. Oh, hey, Bean. He goes out there and he does his, uh, he does this thing for the pilgrims. He's, he leads the prayer. And he comes back and he's all drunk off of this power. He's drunk off this religious power. And, um, and he sits down and he's like, the spirit presence has been invoked, you know. And then she's like, oh, thank the Lord for that, you know. Like, she's just like, this is such bullshit. Like, she's just like always like being like, this is bullshit. You're bullshit. Everything you're doing is bullshit. Uh, this is not real. Uh, this is like, shut up, you know, shut up, Korba, shut up, you dumb bitch. Uh, and also like, you know, he's like, we are the Lord's, you know, emissaries. Where she's like, you're spies. That's what you are. You're spies. Like, don't get it twisted, dude. You're spies. Like, we know what you are. Shut up. You know, she's always reducing things to their basic element and just telling the truth of what they really are. And that's, that's something that's a, a function of the crone, you know, it's just like, an older woman who's been around who sees all the bullshit and points it out and it's like okay you can say whatever you want and put your little ideals over all of this but really uh you're bullshit and this is what you're actually doing so like let's just be real about it and then I also loved um like Paul is like so since he's kind of coming to the end you know Paul is on a on a track for destruction here He's just trying to enjoy what time he has left, even though he knows that it's kind of things are coming to a close uh, and things are headed in a way that it's not exciting for him. He's just trying to enjoy what's left. So instead of being angry with Alia, because normally he might be angry with her, you know, for like trolling this guy and just being like, we don't need to troll this guy. But he like softens and he softens to her and he, and he thinks to himself, how could anyone react to Korba with anything other than cynical humor? Uh, what's more ridiculous then death commando turned transformed into a priest you know i was like oh like he's just like normally he'd be mad but he's like i can't even be mad you know like she's right he's a douche like this guy's stupid um and i also love the beautiful beautiful foreshadowing when corb is out there leading the prayer there's a trick of the light the sun comes in and behind him it casts this um this light illusion that makes uh, Stilgar see Korba as a figure crucified on a fiery wheel, you know? So it's like, oh man, like that's, and he's like disturbed by this, but he doesn't say anything, you know? But it's just like, he's looking for the signs, you know? There's all these signs that like, oh, Korba's gonna get fucked, you know? It's just like, cause we all, cause again, we've read Bronze's uh, analysis of history. You know, we know that he is discovered for what, for his part in all of this conspiracy. Uh, and so, yeah, so he kind of is like crucified on this fiery wheel, you know, it's like we all know this character is gonna get his at some point, you know, it's like it's gonna happen. Uh, and the wheel is such a beautiful symbolism of just like the cycles of life and like he's just he's stuck on this cycle just like everybody else. He's playing his part just like everybody else is. Uh, I also love that Alia and Paul, like, they know that Irulan is a spy. Like, they all know that she's the woman on the inside. They know that she talks to her Bene Gesserit proctors and everything. Like, they know. So, like, when Irulan starts asking him more about prescience, you know, he really doesn't want to share more because he knows that whatever he says is going to end up in the Bene Gesserit's ear. Uh, but at the same time, he still has to try. So it's interesting how he talks about prescience and, like, how Alia... You know, when Alia feels like maybe he said a little bit too much, she comes up and she tries to obfuscate the explanation um, so that the Bene Gesserit don't learn too much about how it works. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. Also, Paul uh, daydreaming about taking Chani and seeking sanctuary on Two Pile um, was like, oh, so sad. You know, it's just like, what if, what if I just, me and Chani, we just got in a ship and we went over there and I'm just like, I'm sorry. I don't want anything to do with this. I please just let me live in peace here. You know, like, please, like, please just let me live in peace. Like, I mean, that's how like upsetting all this is, you know, it's just like thing. But he's like, but he can't, you know, he can't do that because if he does that, things will get much worse. You know, it's like he can't let go because he knows that if he does, he'll be responsible for things that he could not let happen on his conscience. Um I also think it's interesting we talk about the religious pilgrims that are coming to Arrakis. So, you know, since since the Kisaret has spread throughout the universe and spread this, you know, Messiah, you know, new religion of Muad'Dib, uh, you have all of these religious pilgrims who are who have converted 
you know, to this, oh, this god emperor, you know, well, not quite yet, but <laughs> this this demigod emperor, uh, you know, there, there's a pilgrimage, there's a pilgrimage that you can go on, and this is, Arrakis is the last stop, you know, on this religious pilgrimage, and it reminded me a lot of, like, Israel, how Israel is, like, the religious pilgrimage destination in the earth, <laughs> you know, like, on earth, You've got Christian pilgrims going there. You've got Muslim pilgrims going there. You've got uh, fucking Jewish pilgrims going there. You know, it's like I I would like to go to Israel just to like check it out and do all the fun religious rides and like see what the deal is. I would love to experience that. Um, but yeah, I, I enjoyed how, how Paul was disturbed by them though. He's like, they come and they come and like this is all just like they're getting scammed out of their money. Like this is such a bad idea. They're a, a disgusting source of wealth for this planet. And yet, you know, they go away happy. You know, it's, it's disturbing to him. He's like, they find whatever they're looking for here. And he's just like, what are they even looking for? But they find it like, oh my God. Um, and uh, another thing, though, the last thing in this chapter that I really loved is if you remember, if you rem if, let's go back to session one. If you remember, uh, Irulan disses Edric and she's like she um, she disses him as just being a dumb machine. Like you're only here because you hide this thing, not because you're awesome, you know, and he's just being used essentially by the conspirators, not because this guy's awesome, but just because he provides a functionality. And, and, and so, you know, she, she really, like, jabs at him with that, you know. I mean, that's a really sharp little stick that she points at him. But then now we see Irulan in her life, she's used as a recording device. And that's the reason that she talks shit to Edric, because that's something that happens to her and it's something that she hates. Because one of the things that the Bene Gesserits are taught when they're coming up is how to memorize, completely memorize someone saying something, how they said it. Uh, they have to be able to um, imitate the voice even. Um, it's kind of, it's not like distrans, you know, but I mean, it's, it's again, because it's like the, the Bene Gesserit are like, we're not going to be implanting people with technology, okay? We're not going to be implanting people with technology. That's fucked up. We're just going to teach people how to remember a message and then say it and say it back completely perfectly with the same cadence and everything. Um, and so that's what she's being used for in this. He's like, okay, Irulan, you're ready to start recording? And she's just like, Ugh, okay, you know, and she's like, this is a princess, you know, and she's been, she's being used as a recording device. I mean, it's just like, ah, uh, sucks for Irulan, you know. Uh, and then, um, let's see here, let's go back. Um, let's go to the gift of hate. So next up, Edric, our, our guildsmen uh, and his guild homies, they roll up in Paul's imperial court and they present their gift of hate. Uh, they, they, uh, and before we get into Argola, let's discuss, but before we get into that, let's discuss Paul's formal crown. And this is like a whole side tangent thing, but I think that this is really important. So this is what we're going to do. Paul's formal crown is described as having a fish and fist emblems. It is emblazoned with fish and fist emblems. And like, and I saw somebody asking this question in my Patreon questions, so we're just gonna kind of go over this now. Paul is like a super future space Jesus. Hear me out. <laughs> 2,000 years ago in our world, IRL, uh, when, when Jesus came around, uh, the Jewish people were looking for a Messiah to come help them claim their land back from Rome. Uh, Israel had been placed under Roman rule, and uh, they, you know, there was prophesied that a, a you know warrior Messiah would come and like help them get everything together, um, just like you know David. And, and Saul and his son Solomon, you know, it's like these were like some warrior, divine warrior guys who were sent from God to help Israel get their land back, you know, like they just want to be able to govern themselves. I mean, who wants to be governed by other people? Nobody wants that. You want to govern yourself. And so they're in a position where they wanted that. And, um, and they were ripe for rebellion. They were ripe for rebellion. And then um, this, this Jesus character comes and he is not 
the warrior messiah that they were looking for. And he, instead of choosing to use his um, divine powers to take back Israel and even take Rome, uh, he decides to be to take a crown of thorns on the cross instead. Um, and he sacrifices himself instead because he is a messenger of love. I mean, his whole... Um, I mean, his whole thing is like, you know, love one another, you know, like love your neighbor. Like, so it's like this guy's not going to go around and conquer Rome for you, you know. And um, and so what, is, what does all this have to do with the fucking crown? Well, Paul is like a simulation of what if Jesus had used his divine powers to help the Jews take back Israel and also take Rome itself in the process. I mean, that's essentially kind of what this is. And Jesus and the Christian faith is symbolized by the ichthys, a fish. You've seen that fish symbol. We've all seen the fish symbol. Um, and, um, and this takes us, so it's like Paul has the fish on his crown. So it's like he has also chosen a fish symbol, but there's also a fist. You know, I love that it's like the fish and the fist. It's like, yeah, love, but I, it's tough love. You know, it's like he's like, yeah, love. Uh, I'm doing this out of love and compassion, but I will beat your ass. Like, this is, like, tough love. This isn't, like, chill love. And um, and one thing that I think is really interesting about Jesus being associated with the fish symbol is, you know, if you're into the astro astrology type of stuff, uh, there are zodiac zodiacal ages that last about 2,000 years. And, uh, and so Jesus, uh, some people consider Jesus to be an avatar of the Piscean age, the age of Pisces, the age of monotheism, religion, um, of, of building, uh, connecting the world, community. And I, I got this, let me, let me just read this. This is from freethoughtnation.com. Traditional astrology sees Aries as the first sign and Pisces as the last sign. Uh, which is interesting because he's like, oh, I'm the alpha and the omega. You know, it's like I'm the end and the beginning, you know. So it's like I'm the end of the, the Aries and the beginning of the age of Pisces. Uh, and from this system, the time of Jesus marked the end of the previous great year from 25,800 years to the start of the great uh, years and the start of a new great year when the equinox shifted back from the sign of the first zodiac age, Aries, to the last zodiac age, Pisces. Do you see the resemblance with the Christ myth? Jesus Christ is the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, Aries and Pisces. He is the sacrificial lamb of God, end of the age of Aries, and the fisher of men, dawn of the age of Pisces. His symbol is ichthys or fish. He, uh, he calls himself fishers of men as his disciples. His communion food is designated as fish. When he asks for as much after his resurrection, his early Christian followers were called the little fishes and represented by two fishes a symbol for Pisces so yeah uh, Paul adorns his crown with a motherfucking fish y'all so I think that's really interesting so back to the story okay <laughs> like that's back from my weird stuff let's go back so so they're like hey guild the guild's like hey here's this Gola uh his name is hate the Lelox who trained him as a Zinsuni Mentat uh, we know he was your boy Duncan Idaho, so we're just bringing him back and giving to you, giving him to you as a gift. And Paul cannot help but take him back, even though he knows that it's a trap. You know, it's like he knows it's a trap. Uh, but like this Gola is a direct line to his past before his transformation into the Kwisatz Haderach. Uh, this man was a mentor. This man was a friend. This man taught him how to fly thopters, how to defend himself. He was his father's friend. I mean, he was his father's lieutenant. I mean, essentially, sword master. Um, and with him, this Gola brings us just a small taste of that normalcy that Paul thirsts for, you know, of the life before all of this, before all of this burden that he has to carry. Um, he loved Duncan. I mean, he loved this man. Like, he loved him. And, you know, he can't rise. He says to himself that he cannot rise above his compassion. You know, he can, like, what demands does this flesh make? You know, and he just cannot rise above his compassion. And it's interesting that Jesus is a great teacher of compassion. You know, see the golden rule. Um, and so it's like, he can't. He's like, I love this guy. I can't. I can't. Even though he's not him. And I know it's not him. You know, I, I can't. 
I can't not, you know, I cannot not. And he also, I love that he also thinks to himself, many a fish took the bait and escaped, you know? So he's like, he's like, I know this is a trap, but then he thinks of himself as a fish who's like take, taking this bait, but hoping to escape the hook, you know? Like that's his deal. And I mean, if you think back to the first Dune, Thufir, who also trained him, the Mintat who trained him, uh, he says knowing where the trap is is the first step to avoiding it. So, I mean, and I mean, just like his father, his father knew Arrakis was a trap, but he did it anyways. He's like, I know it's a trap, but maybe I can like, I, I think, even though I know this is a trap, I think that I can figure my way out of this. You know, I believe in my own powers. I believe in my own power. Uh, I can totally make this work. You know, I just, I have to know it's a trap and be aware. And so that's what Paul's doing. And it's interesting that, okay, so let's, let's talk a little bit about the Zen Sunni philosophy situation. So in the Dune universe, uh, a lot of religions have kind of come together and, and mix matched each other and, and formed these new religions. And so in the Zen Sunni situation, you have Islam, Sunni Islam paired with Zen Buddhism. And I think there is also Zen Sufism that is uh, talked about much, much later. So, I mean, there I assume there's also um, Zen Shiiteism, I guess. I don't know. Uh, but the, Z- the Zen-, Zen Sunnis are more of the pacifists. Um, they're, they're very, because Zen is, is very kind of pacifist. And so I love it when, when Duncan says, the cleansed mind makes decisions in the presence of unknowns and without cause and effect, you know? And that really made me think about Watts Wave 3 because that's like all what he's talking about. Like Alan Watts is talking about the past is the result of the present. We have this idea that time is linear, that everything grows out of the past, that we're these puppets of the past, and that that is not the reality of the situation. There is only the present moment. There is only now. And now is like this ship. And what trails behind it, the wake of the ship, you know, is the past, you know, and it's like the prow is the future. And it's like the past and the future are kind of like this, this cause and effect thing. Like it's kind of bullshit is 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 the deal and again i'm not ex- like listen to watts wave three he alan watts explains it a lot better than i do um but uh but that throws paul off he's like wait without cause and effect you know like what you know because like, paul has a very western way of thinking and also he sees the past and the future so it's like he can't help but think of cause and effect he cannot like that's he lives his whole life by that so for this guy to be like oh there's not cause and effect like that's like whew. What? That's going to throw him off. And like all of this Zen Sunni philosophy that hate is is telling him uh, is definitely throwing him off a little bit, which is what he's supposed to do. And he's also supposed to enlarge his moral compass to, you know, show the delineations between good and evil. Um, but the thing is, is like hate is so cool, though. You know, he's so cool. He's like the best. And like he's, you know, Paul's like, oh, what do you what do you think your purpose is? And he's like, to destroy you, I guess. Like, that's all I can come up with. Like, he's he's honest about it. And Paul's just like, oh, my God, this guy is so awesome. Like, I can't even. And he's even like, send me away. Send me away, sire. Like, you you don't want to get fucked up. Send me away. Like, I, I don't think it's a great idea. Like, even even hate is like. I don't think it's a great idea to stay here. Like, I don't like, I don't, I, I like you so far. And like, I, I don't, you know, I'm supposed to know you. I don't know, but it seems like a bad idea. And Paul's just like, fuck, you're staying, bro. You're staying. Oh my God, you're staying. You're so staying. You're the coolest. And also it's like, he's another motherfucker on their level. I mean, do you know how many people are like, these guys are the elite of the elite of the elite. Okay. Like, and that shit is isolating. Like Paul is so motherfucking isolated and here's somebody that he can just talk to like a person, you know, like ugh, it's so valuable. He's so valuable. You can't let that go away. Um, and then meanwhile, Ollie has been watching all of this from her little her little spy position. She's got her little that's that's I love the Benny Jesuit. They always have these little spy holes everywhere where they're always like watching stuff, you know, and recording things and checking it out. And she's watching this whole situation. And uh, and Paul's like, gosh, I hope Alia can help me with it. And then Alia's over here like, damn, he fine, though. Like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to help you, bro, because this is a weapon turned to me, too, because I think this dude is hot. And again, think about it. It's like Alia. Who is Alia going to date? Who's Alia gonna, who, who, what man in the universe 
is going to impress Alia. You know, like that, that woman is on a level, all of her, all her own, all her own, all her own. Okay. Like, it's like, who is she supposed to date? You know? And it's like, oh, here comes this motherfucker. And it's just like, oh man. And I love that the, uh, the Leiloks who even gave him his youth back, they, they de-aged his body somehow. It's like, what the fuck? Like, that's some crazy stuff. Um, but yeah, Ali is like, damn, he fine. And I'm like, me too, girl. I get it. Like, shit. Um, <laughs> so, uh, let's go to our, our last, our last chapter. Um, we have the Reverend Mother and the Princess. So when Edric came to Arrakis with his homies and with Hate and everybody, he was traveling on a Highliner. And on this Highliner was Reverend Gaius Helen Mohim, one of our conspirators. And this woman, I think, I mean, it, they don't really say why she was there. Like, I think that she was there to, like, talk. She was talking with probably Edric and presumably a, consulting with him before he went down to the planet. But somehow Paul finds out. We're not sure how he finds out, but he finds out that she's on that ship. And he sends agents to take her into captivity on to Dune. Because, again, it's like he knows that the Gil is, he knows everybody's gunning for him, trying to fuck him up. And he's like, oh, okay, so Edric comes. And then Guy's Helmohim just happens to be on the Highliner. Yeah, right. You know, so let's just go ahead and capture this bitch. Um, and it's unclear whether the Guild somehow gave her away and the Guild wanted her to get captured. And maybe somehow the Guild leaked that she was on the ship because they wanted to get rid of her. Or whether Paul's spies figured it out, you know? It hasn't been made clear what the deal is, but she's, you know, Gaius is like, <sighs> I have a feeling that the guild probably fucked me on this one, but she's not sure. So Irulan comes to her old teacher, her mentor, and her Bene Gesserit superior. I mean, not only is this her ex-teacher, but this is somebody who's kind of like her Bene Gesserit boss. And they have a secret conversation with their finger code uh, which I thought was fantastic. Uh, they're they're talking. I love that they're talking and they're saying these like banal things to one another to try to throw everybody off. And meanwhile, they're having a real conversation with their hands. Um, and uh, and Irulan is now being put to the test. I mean, even though you know Gaius is like in a death cell and she's like I'm not getting out of this whatever you know it's like she's still like Irulan is like still gonna be tested you know she's even in a worse place than Gaius in a lot of ways and um and it's like she she may Irulan may have failed her, her Bene Gesserit training like she was trained to carry an heir to the throne I mean that's what she was completely brought up to do is to carry a child of an emperor and start a line and the Bene Gesserit would be in on all this and like that was I mean she, and they they bred this woman to be beautiful and wonderful and attractive and like really like people would want to have sex with her um but uh I love that the, the Reverend Mother is thinking to herself it's like it doesn't matter how hot she is she is a whining shrew more interested in words than actions like paul is never gonna want to fuck this lady like she sucks like she may be hot as fuck but she is a whining shrew i was like oh my god like that's so brutal a savage um but even though you know the original plan for her has been messed up uh and she's not going to end up carrying a royal heir they still they're they're going to salvage what they can the Bene Gesserit, you know they're not about throwing things away they're not about waste they're not wasteful women and so they still have plans for Irulan. And the plan is, do not let Cheney get pregnant, uh, even if it means your own life. If you have to kill her, kill her. If she gets pregnant, put an abortifact in her drink, abort that baby. I don't even care if you get pinned on it. Uh, you're going down with her. It doesn't matter. It's, it's a, you can die. Doesn't matter. Like, we are willing to spend your life to make sure that this woman does not get pregnant and start an imperial line for the Atreides because if that happens our breeding program is going to be disrupted for god knows how long and like she's like she doesn't even know how right she is um and they're like and also meanwhile they also want to preserve this bloodline that they have been carefully crafting over thousands of generations and so she's like you know what your your time is done Paul's never going to have sex with you 
Uh, you need to try to get Paul and Alia to hook up any way you can. You need to throw them into situations together, into intimate situations together. Maybe if Cheney dies, uh, that the grief dissolves traditional barriers. They're both they both must be incredibly lonely people. They most like uh, they're both so isolated. Uh, so maybe we can get them to hook up so that we don't have to worry about any genes that we're not aware of getting into this because they would much rather have a crossbred baby than have a baby with. Cheney's genes genetics because they have no idea what her genetics are they have no idea they have no idea what's going on with that and so if they put this wild Fremen genetics in in this bloodline it's just gonna like they no that's not that's not no no um and at first Irulan is like what like and I love it's like she almost broke you know she almost broke at this she's like what like I'm supposed to do what um, but she comes to her senses, and she takes it like a Bene Gesserit and a princess, and she accepts her mission, accepts her mission. Um, also in this, in this, uh, also in this chapter, we talk about the Dune Tarot. The Dune Tarot comes up. We have Gaius in her cell playing with some Dune Tarot cards. Uh, we get to hear about three major Arcana cards. There, and in the original, like in our tarot there are 22 major arcana cards and so three of them are are talked about the quizats hatterack the great worm and the desolate sand these are all major arcana cards and then she also uh, mentions the eight of ships which is a minor arcana card uh so i love that ships is a suit you know there's there's ships um so that was really cool i was as a tarot as a student of the tarot I, I was really excited to hear about that um so yes uh and i have we're gonna take a break in a second but uh, when i come back i did bring my dune encyclopedia so i want to show you some of the dune tarot information that's in there um we're going to discuss that a little bit um oh magnus danger the tarot and the zodiac both give you a disgust response you're triggered why are you triggered why are you triggered, dude? Like, why are you letting yourself get triggered? What is that? Where's that coming from? Why does it bother you so much, you know? Um, think about these things. Be, be aware of these things. You know, be aware of the things that you're instantly repulsed by. You know, those are the things that there's something going on there. You need to dig in there. Um, but uh, but that's, I mean, that's a lot of people's response. A lot of people are very, very anti, anti-mysticism uh, in this day and age. Very anti. And I get it. I mean, it's like religion has wreaked a lot of havoc in our world for the past 2,000 years. Like, I get it. Like, I mean, people are kind of fed up with it. But don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You know what I'm saying? Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Um, so, okay, guys. Uh, we are going to take a break. Um, now, do you... I'm going to ask you, do you want me to put Dune Wave back on or I could just put the Be Right Back screen? It's up to you guys. I don't know if you guys want to do all that again, if it's too much for you. It's a, it's a kind of a Sunday afternoon. It might be a little bit a little bit much. Um, but yeah, we're going to take a quick break for like a few minutes. Um, I'm going I'm to like boop it on my watch. We'll give it like five minutes. And then we're going to come back and we're going to talk about, uh, okay, you guys want more Dune Wave. All right, I'm going to put it back on. Um, we'll come back and uh, talk more about questions we're going to take some questions from my patreon team 19 members and then we'll ask some of the questions you guys can give me some some questions too thank you caspaz for the cheer thank you for everyone who has uh decided to become a subscriber today thank you guys so much um really appreciate it hope you're having a good time and we will be right back <laughs> I hold at your neck the Gong Jabbar. I hold at your neck the Gong Jabbar. The Gong Jabbar, the high handed enemy. It's a needle with a drop of poison on its tip. Feel that poison. Ah uh ah. -uh. 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 Don't 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 pull away or you'll feel the poison. A duke's son must know about poisons. 
the quick ones and the slow ones and the ones in between, here's a new one for you, the Gom Jabbar. It kills only animals. Suggest you may be human. If you withdraw your hand from the box, you die. This is the only rule. This is the only rule. If you withdraw your hand from the box, you die. This is the only rule. This is the only rule. Keep your hand in the box and live. Keep your hand in the box and live. Keep your hand in the box and live. Withdraw it and die. I must not fear. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. And when it is gone back. must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. When it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. I must not fear. Fear is the mind killer. Fear is the little death that brings total obliteration. I will face my fear. I will permit it to pass over me and through me. When it has gone past, I will turn the inner eye to see its path. Where the fear has gone, there will be nothing. Only I will remain. What's in the box? What's in the box? What's in the box? Pain. Pain. What's in the box? off a leg to escape a trap? That's an animal kind of trick. A human would remain in the trap, endure the pain, feigning death that he might kill the trapper and remove a threat to his kind. Why are you doing this? Why are you doing this? To determine if you're human. emptied of everything except the hand immersed in agony. He thought he could feel skin curling black on that agonized hand, the flesh crisping and dropping away until only 
from the box, young human, and look at it. Do it. Do it. He jerked his hand from the box, stared at it, astonished. Not a mark. No sign of agony on the flesh. He held up the hand, turned it, flexed the fingers. Pain, she sniffed. A human can override any nerve in the body. Ever sift sand through a screen? We been a Jesuit sift people to find the humans. Find the humans. Paul felt that he had been infected with terrible purpose. Terrible purpose. He did not know yet what the terrible purpose was. Why do you test for humans? to set you free. To set you free. Free? Once, men turned 